Hey, people, this is the time. I mean, we are legitimately worth a shit this year. Ah, yes, indeed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, outsiders of all ages. <laughs> It is that show that pretends to be legitimately worth a shit. We'll see if we pull it off tonight. We yep. are the Outsiders, and we are brought to you by Poncho, ponchooutdoors.com. There's Colt in a Poncho shirt. They've got all the shirts you need. Look at Bo. Look at Bo. I'm in a Poncho shirt. Bottom left. He's uh, modeling a Poncho shirt for us tonight. Shout out to Poncho for their great sponsorship. We do appreciate them it is a wednesday show that means there's an important question to ask in about 150 days to question texas fans well the 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 four words they'll care about are it just means more but right now those four words are what are you drinking on a wednesday and here we go your upper left is the quarterback mock five chance mock chance what are we drinking Oh, it's tonight. I'm, I'm going back to our buddies, our, our Roy Williams, BJ Johnson, MVP vodka with water, a little splash of lime juice, make it give it a little bit of flavor. You know, this is a diet drink, right? Mm. This is for if you want to look like a wide receiver and still be able to drink your vodka, you go with MVP vodka, obviously, because if you've seen those guys, they look a lot better than all of us. Mm, it's true. Good point. Diet advertising works. You hey, know, oh, yeah. Thomas looked better with fireworks, though, and he wasn't drinking MVP vodka. Yeah. I think Sloan was drinking anything they'd give him that night. I think so, too. <laughs> so Chance is going with a little diet beverage. Speaking of diet beverages, your lower right tonight is Jason Dick. He's famous for some pretty weird diet beverages. We'll see if he's got one tonight. Jason, what are you drinking? I, I tell you what, guys. These Wednesdays, they come around so goddamn quick, all right? And I'm starting to get <laughs> sad that I started this whole bit. I mean, what bit? This is just the way that I operate all the time. Uh, it's been a long day for your guy, so I figured I needed a little pick me up i was at the uh, convenience store i was like what do we have in the way of energy beverages and i came across a <laughs> lucky fact wow <laughs> wow Vic, <laughs> lucky fuck <laughs> i don't wow. know man it says sparkling bogacious <laughs> berry uh, that sounds like elf. something you would drink in college when you're like broke and you're eating your ramen and you're drinking your lucky fuck <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I didn't know that. I'm, I'm and you're happy program. as shit doing it too. Give, give us a sip. Give us a taste test. Let's get, see the facial expression. Let's see the reaction. What do you got? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, yes. So much fact. Do you, can, um, <laughs> do you consider yourself lucky right now? Oh, I'm lucky to have all this fact, guys. That is <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Your lower left five tonight. super ingredients. There's five super Wait, ingredients. There's guys. five of them. Hey, yeah, yeah. Jason, yeah. can you go by like that tonight's one? Outsiders program? Okay, okay. five super ingredients. Five so super I have a favor to ask, Mister Dick. Yeah. Can you go to that store tomorrow and drop me a pin so I can go get some Lucky Fact and some Four Loco? Since I'm going to have to chug it anyway, I'm going to get them both at the same location so I can. Mix the fact with the four loco and really experience the power hour. All right, I'm on, wow. I'm on it. Look at that. Wow. Bow drinking. Uh -huh. All right, Bow Edge, what are we drinking? Trying to think Tonight, up a little bit. We're going lucky with Mictor's, Mictor's small batch sour mash, but it's been a day, so we're taking it with the Coors Light Chaser. Ah, the old oh. whiskey Coors combo. <laughs> That is fantastic. Somebody I, told me, Chad, I don't know, did they have this rule at AM as well? Because the rule I had was you don't mix big beer and liquor. I, I heard um, that was a really bad combination. Liquor, be yeah. liquor before beer, you're in the clear. Beer before liquor, you've never been sicker. Beer, correct. Because you wanna you wanna lay the foundation with the strong stuff. That's what you want to do. You're right. Don't do them at the same time. Start with the stronger stuff, mix in the other stuff. Chad, how long we known each other? About 25 years? Yeah. Do you think I've ever given a shit about mixing anything? I'm just going to yeah. drink and see how it sorts out. I'm really surprised that Bo is not drinking his sour mash with a Coors Light top on it. Like, instead of mixing it with Diet Coke, just pour the Coors Light on the sour mash. Well, yeah. I'm not a complete alcoholic. I just <laughs> I, I have a tolerance level that some don't. So, just like Chance, I'm trying to watch my figure. So, Chance, tonight we're going with a mixture of Deep Eddie Peach and Deep Eddie lime vodka i call it a leech and we'll just be sipping that throughout the evening mm. r.i.p mike lovely <laughs> it is lovely yeah we'll do that we'll do his little rest in peace to the pirate himself 
uh, to Coach Leach tonight. All right, so it's the Outsiders brought to you by Poncho. We do have a very special guest coming up on a What Are You Drinking Wednesday. And if you're a Texas hardball fan, you know the name Ty Harrington. He's coming up to talk some Longhorn baseball. We'll get some stories, I'm sure, and we'll have ourselves a good time uh, with that. Before we do, Bo, I have a presentation for you and a proposal for you on okay. your payoff. Okay. Be right before that, I do want to say congratulations to Eric Hart, who jumped in the chat line. We now have chatters from Washington, New York City, mm -hmm. and West Virginia. We've added another. St we already had a bunch of Oklahomans, hmm. but we're adding every state in the 48. Very nice. To our mix. That is excellent. Uh, speaking of a mix, if y'all don't know, Bo has done horribly in NFL picks, so he's officially <laughs> lost. He can't catch up with the Super Bowl, so he has to do a power hour. Now, the committee got together and discussed an idea. I'm going to present it. We'll see if Chance and Jason agree, but basically the committee decided that they like Bo. They don't really want Bo to have to take a shot every minute because then maybe there's no Bo at the end of the hour. So, Bo, here's the presentation. A can of Four loco is 23 and a half ounces. Based on the normal shot, 16 shots in an hour. That's what you're looking at, okay? But here's the proposal. If you pick something about the Super Bowl that you want to bet on, we will all agree to whatever it is. If you win that bet, we will take those number of shots down to 10. Then you'll only be taking a shot every six minutes instead of every three and a half. But if you lose, you then have to do the original 16 plus you add five shots of diet, cherry, moon mist, pineapple, fact, lucky fact, <laughs> How about along this? with it. How about or this? Or you can I'm just gonna, stand I'm, gonna, I'm a negotiator, so I'm going to try to negotiate my penance. All right, what do you want? And the screen froze. That's the perfect sign. Yeah. Um, how about this? I'll throw out a prop bet on the Super Bowl. If it doesn't hit, mm -hmm. I will just drink two cans of Four Loco Whoa. during a show. Okay. Instead of the shots, it's tough to talk and do shots and do it. I'll just drink two Four Locos during the show. That's if I, problem. I'm drinking one Four Loco no matter what. If I lose my bet, I drink a second one. But I will do the one. If I do the one, I will just pound the motherfucker. <laughs> just me going, dunk, 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 until wow. it's gone. Okay. So it's one anyway. It's two if you lose. Yeah. What if you win? I still have to drink one. I lose, okay? I wow. The day quill rotted my brain for the month of January. I only <laughs> have about three hours left until I can get back to sanity, which is February and not January. Everybody else does dry January or whatever. I did day cool January and it rotted my freaking brain. Wow. But I'll pick right when it when it comes out of this. All right. Fair mm -hmm. enough. I tried to help you out and do a little more. I know. I appreciate you it. Didn't, you I didn't want it. it. So there if you go. I lose, I will own up and I will pay. I'm drinking the damn four locos. Just whether or not I have to yeah. shoot it or whether I can Wait. chug it. Okay. Bo, Bo set that up saying I'm a negotiator, and he went from owing us one four loco to possibly owing us one or two four locos. But I definitely know. at least day, one. Sir. Hey, I, I you need to give Jason, Jason, you need to give Bo one of those memberships to your poker club because it sounds like he'd be phenomenal. He'd be a hit there with everybody. Man, that is excellent. Okay, so and that's good news because now I don't have to think of all that complicated math. Nope. Our man, Blake, the super producer, does not have to make us up some crazy clocks to count down. We're good. So that's coming up. The We're going to go Thursday after the Super Bowl, if y'all are good with that. That's the day after Valentine's Day. That's February 15th is when Bo oh. will have to do some sort of four loco chugging during an outsider yeah, show. He's going to need to get hydrated after Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> darn right. And I'm still stuck on the fact that somebody on the chat named Morgan Hill says he was in my house and Razor told him, no, you weren't. And he said it was years ago. I don't know who this is, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm. I just, I'm just trying to... Weird things going on in the chat tonight, too. All <laughs> right. Uh, I've owned a few houses, and some of them were, as Chance can understand, they were known to be party houses. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Uh, speaking of a party, we're going to have a good time talking to Ty Harrington. But before we do that, the folks at Covert want to show you some stuff that's rolling. Your vehicle says Texas proud more than a Ford from Covert Ford of Austin. 
Deeply rooted in Texas history, the Cover family has taken great pride for over 114 years. That's why you can always depend on Cover Ford to deliver the best customer experience and a superior selection of new Ford vehicles. Shop online at covertford.com. Yes, indeed. All right. If it's about time for one of those interviews, then it's brought to you by Last Stand Hats. There's a lot of different outsiders hats. Here's the real life version. That's actually the same hat, isn't it? Look at that. Look at that bad boy. That's the one I like. That's old school. That's a little Daryl. That's a little Daryl Gus kind of hat right there. Bo's rocking a black version. There are 12 different outsiders hats. You got Occupy left field stuff. You got DBU stuff. You got all gas, no brakes versions. If you're a Longhorn fan, and if you love those Texas State Bobcats, like our next guest also does, they've got Texas State stuff for you as well. Uh, we'll be talking about both of those teams with our next guest. Last Stand Hats, use that Outsiders 10 code to get it done. All right, it is time to talk to the man, the myth, the legend. He doesn't need an introduction except for me to say Ty Harrington. What's up, Coach? Well, gentlemen, I got to be honest with you. We need to... I was trying to take notes on what everybody was drinking, and I got a little baffled, Jason. I'm not really sure what you got working down there. I'm not, I had what's, to rethink and recalculate. What's the fucking problem? <laughs> you know, my, my dad told me he learned something new every day if you pay attention, and I, and I did. I definitely learned something new. I think everybody else on this show did as well. Hey, you know what we learned, Ty, a long time ago with Jason is all that stuff, the rest of us just walk by and go, what the hell? He actually buys it and drinks it. <laughs> he had some shit called Diet Moon Mist, and he started speaking gibberish to the TV. Yeah. And, uh, Ty, if you ever come across some moon mist in your travels, be very careful, my friend, okay? Yeah. The moon mist is not to be taken lightly. All right? Oh, man. Bo, why don't you get us started? Be taken lightly or taken at all? Yeah, probably not yeah. to be taken at all. Exactly. Bo, get us started with Ty Harrington. All right, Ty. After you left the University of Texas as a great player in College World Series, what made you decide to become a coach? Because you've had a great career as a coach. What was the kind of decision tree there when you got out of college and you're like, I'm going to go coach? Well, how about let's start with when, when you played for – UT back then, your expectations, and the same as today too, by the way, but back in the 80s, your expectations were you were going to go play professional baseball. And um, and I, after kind of judging and seeing who all was on our team and everybody that was going to be drafted pretty high, uh, I knew I wasn't. So, and Coach Gus and I had a, a, a pretty good relationship, actually a great relationship. So going into my senior fall meeting, which is where the coaches would tell you, Coach Gus would say, hey, this is where I think you fit in. This is, you know, whatever your, your role might be. So I walked into office and I was like, Coach, it's my fourth time. I get it. I, I, I know who I am because he was about to tell me what I needed to work on or something else. And I said, I got one question for you, Coach, and that's it. I said, I, I really want to coach. My dad had been a college football coach and a high school football coach. And I was like, I think I want to coach. I don't see myself playing in the big leagues but I like the game. I like to stick around it. And uh, immediately he was like, yes, let's, let's plan on that. So going into my senior year, I already knew what I was going to do when I got done. And, uh, and so I, like I said, I wanted to be a coach. My dad tried to talk me out of being a coach and uh, just because the lifestyle is different and, uh, and unusual. And um, coach Gus was, who was truly one of the greatest men in my life. Um, it was like, we'd love to have you aboard. And I learned a ton of stuff. And then also I learned that when you're around Coach Gus, it's pretty plain and simple. And when he said, hey, look, you're not going to probably be our everyday starter. Being a coach would probably be a pretty good idea. And so I became a coach and out of the process of knowing I wasn't going to play in the big leagues and just wanted to be around the game. So I was a very – and i got to be honest with you, if you go back and think of when this is, this is 1980 uh, – I finished in 87, so 1988, <clears throat> excuse me, and – uh so we were, we'd been to Omaha. I'd been to Omaha three times already and played in three national championship games. And, um, and so there were, it was a lot going on. It was a lot of fun uh, to be a part of the university of Texas. And the other part of it, to be brutally honest with you was I didn't want to leave Austin, Texas. 
And so this was my way to get to stick around. And I extended what most people got through chance. I'm sure the rest of you guys probably got through school in four years, four and a half years. Uh, I legged it out in, in five and a half. So it made me, <laughs> I got to be able to stay, you know, that's three hours, you know, a semester. And I got to stick around and coach a little bit. My parents kept going, son, you got to go get a job. I was like, I got one. I'm coaching at Texas. You guys see that, right? You just got to keep paying my rent. We're good. Hey, coach, coach, I don't want to one up you, but it took me six and a half, and I didn't get a doctorate. I, I graduated from the McCall School of Business, but it took six and a half years to get there because I enjoyed the University of Texas that much. I'm from Round Rock. I grew up here. I completely agree with your assessment. Hey, if it was Coach, let me tell you, if I was playing in today's time, I would have been on the Michael Penix tour. Of I'd have stayed in Austin, but I'd have had. I think I'd have made a seven year stretch out of it. Got some NIL money. I'd have made a full career out of staying there. But, you know, I looked at – you actually took the job at Texas State, I believe, in 2000, which was the same year that I got to Texas. Yep. And the thing that sticks out to me is is nowadays – I mean, even going back to the, to the 90s, people were constantly jumping. You stayed 19 years, almost two decades at one place. Yep. That amount of loyalty is very, very rare. Mm-hmm. You have to be in a situation you love with an administrative staff that supports you and that loves you as well. But, you know – I just want to hear from somebody that's done it to stay around a program that long, to build that culture, to watch literally an entire generation of players. I mean, I'm sure you had players that were there seniors your first year that are having babies when you're in your, your later year, you know? So that's, yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah. So <clears throat> first of all, I love San Marcos. Um, it was a great place. Um, Second of all, Texas State, and when I got there, it was still Southwest Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, believe it or not, I was part of the uh, when they made the name change, and then actually we got in trouble because I'd already changed the logos on the hat because we had a SW on the hat, and I'd change it to uh, a T with an S on it, a, tech, a block T with an S on it, and, uh, and everybody, you know, it was controversial changing the name anyway. So the baseball program got blamed for it. And uh, but the reality is, I had to tell everybody, you know, there is Southwest Texas. That is two different words, I'm pretty sure. And so, and uh, so anyway, we we uh, you get somewhere and you life does different things to you, right? And um, I enjoyed the San Marcos. I enjoyed Texas State. We were building something special. And then I had probably I don't know four or five legitimate opportunities to move on to some other places that probably in pay would have been a a, a helpful. Um, but I don't know. I just, I like, it was close to Austin and, uh, which I still loved Austin. I loved the whole country and I loved to play golf. And it was a part of my lifestyle at the time. My family had a lake house on Lake LBJ. So there was a lot of things, a lot of factors that, that went into it. I got remarried right in the middle of it, had young kids again and, uh, didn't want to move them. That became a huge part of it. And, uh, and then you, you we go through a stretch. We built, the new stadium in 2009. Prior to that, we basically had a stadium where we had a, a plat- or plywood fence where actually I would have to go to home plate. And I'll never forget just having to tell Wayne Graham at home plate that if the ball goes through the fence, that it's a ground rule double. Now imagine trying to tell somebody fresh off a national title, hey, look, by the way, if the ball goes through the fence, <laughs> The ground rule double. But anyway, so the, 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 the field was terrible. It was in bad shape. We had these metal bleachers that were so up high. And then we had this, what was like a glorified deer blind at the top of it. And uh, and so we, we that was our stadium. And in 2009, we convinced the administration in a lot of different ways to, um, to help us build a new stadium. And when that happened, you know, we go through a roll of three straight championships, too, in 2009, 10, and 11. And uh, – so, I mean, it was fun. I'm like, we were winning. We got a new stadium. We got all these new, you know, for us, it was, we were catching up with some other programs. And and uh, I just I kind of fell in love with the school and the university, to be honest. We and the people that were around it, the coaches, if you go back and look at a lot of the coaches were there for a long time. And um, and then it, look at it this way. <laughs> Loyalty is one thing and not getting fired is another one too. In this business, in the coaching business, there's, 
I mean, if you get to stick around somewhere long enough, you either got pictures on somebody or you're doing a pretty good job, one or the other. And so, and uh, I didn't, our camera didn't work, so we were doing an okay job. <laughs> it's like he knew the segue into Jason Dick's career. Jason was going to fire. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I wish I would have had some pictures with somebody. Uh, Coach, uh, thanks for being on the show tonight. Based on everything you said, I'm I'm extra excited to ask you this. You seem like a no-nonsense guy, so I expect a real answer here, all right? No facking around. Uh, you played baseball at Texas, assistant coached a little bit. You coached for a long time at Southwest Texas State, Texas State. When we induct you into the Outsiders Hall of Fame, yep. which hat are you wearing? It Well, that's a great question. Mm. I've never been asked good that at this. before. I'm good at this. This is... <laughs> Is one of my things. Um, <laughs> how about how about if I wear a Longhorn hat and a Texas State shirt? Does that count? Does that does that count for anything? But then I could put like a, I mean, I could put a Blaine College shirt on there too, logo on there, a Northeast Texas Community. Are you a NASCAR driver now, Todd? Yeah. What's going on here? What, there's a, I mean, there's I'm a champion. There's I, don't know, I don't know. It's a great question. Ty, I'll, I'll try to get um, you out of this. Why don't we reverse that? You wear the Texas State hat. Wear the Longhorn shirt. That way you tell them because your heart is always going to be in awe. Oh, there you go. That's right. right. But, That's but, right. Your, but your head tells you you should you should give some love to the Bobcats. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Go. That's a great – thank you, Chad. I appreciate you bailing me out on the <laughs> hook. And, hey, hey, these look. are radio professionals. Well, some of them are. Not everybody. <laughs> hey. When I when you've been riding fences as long as I have, you learn you learn how to do those. Yeah, right? I'm the guy double fisting Mictors and Coors Light. So you learn how to do those. Right in hey, a different fence. <laughs> Ty, speaking of, the one thing I wanted to ask you about tonight was the future for Texas in the SEC. You know so much about college baseball, how special it can be. We were talking before we went on about those preseason turn not preseason, early season tournaments that you're going to get to call a little bit, whether it's radio or TV. And they do great stuff at the Rangers and, and Astros stadiums. So, but you know what's some of those teams that, that's going to be involved. Talk to me after your time at Texas, the idea of Texas and fill in the blank being a three game weekend or, or week, you know, during the week series in the sec, what do you make of Texas and baseball going to that conference? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm going to date you back a little bit. If you go back to the eighties, the sec was relevant, but not like they are today. I mean, I, you know, Texas in 83, they win a national title the year before I got there, they beat Alabama in the finals. And then historically, you know, it was Mississippi State and some others that were, were, were good in the 80s. But um, and then as time went on, you saw that conference in so many ways evolve and, and take off and do so many great things. And, man, they don't mess around. I mean, you get right down to it. When you look at the baseball and I mean, guys don't teams don't even make the, the conference tournament that are qualified to go to a regional tournament. You've got I mean, the strength from top to bottom. If you look at the SEC and what – if you're trying to win a regular season conference championship in there or a conference tournament championship, the, the, the gauntlet of what you go through on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday is just – I mean, you're facing first-rounders on Friday night, you're facing fifth-rounders on Saturdays, and you're facing a probably projected – first rounders, a sophomore, freshman on Sundays, and then guys coming out of the pen, same with hitters. And it, I just think that they've donated, I say donated, they, they've committed so many resources to college baseball. And, you know, forever it was the University of Texas and, and a handful of other schools, maybe some West Coast schools, and the SEC started – building some new facilities and doing some different things. LSU started making a run late in the eighties and the nineties with Skip Berkman. And they started kind of increase the, the box and, and doing different things. And, and, but man, you look at the resources that they're putting forward in baseball and college baseball and the impact that that's had on the popularity on college baseball and where it is today, because if you want to win, you got to keep up with what's going on. And, uh, and so certainly Texas is one of those schools that can do that. I know OU is going to try to do the same thing. They're redoing some facilities as well. But, man, it, it just – they don't mess around. And, and, and in college baseball, when you look at their – now how, how many national championships over the last few years have been decided by an SEC team and then how many teams have already been in the SEC – or, I'm sorry, in Omaha from the SEC every year. And so, 
Now, as a as a fan and as an alumnus, shit, you gotta love this. I mean, I mean, it's not not like the Big 12's anything to 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 that, but every weekend, are you kidding me? I mean, I I, I mean it's unreal. Yeah. So so to your point, coach, because I think I think you hit the nail on the head when you look at the evolution of the game. Number one, I think and, and I have a, a real passion for the game of baseball. I think it's the one of the I think it's the greatest game ever invented. But I, I watched the evolution of what TV has done and the revenue that baseball is now getting on the college level, because for a long time, you didn't really get until they got to maybe super regionals. You'd pick up a game here and there. But now you're getting games all week long. Yeah. And, and I, me personally, I can't wait to make a trip to Hoover, Alabama, to watch the SEC championship because right. that's going to be awesome. But to what you just said, I think it's interesting. It's almost like the college football world with the SEC. These guys, <clears throat> week in, week out, are facing these electric pitchers and these bats that are up and down the lineup where they can hit one yeah. through nine. I, do you feel like it prepares them that when they get – to Omaha, they played the big games. They've seen the big pitchers. They've been doing it all year long. Well, yeah. I mean, also, too, and I mean, and, and to credit to Texas on this, too, I could say the same thing about them. They're playing in front of enormous crowds. Now, look, you know, for all, if, the, if the five of us were shooting free throws in the back of Jason's backyard and, and not drinking whatever that thing he's drinking, we're shooting free throws. <laughs> You know, our I'm nerves are pack and shooter, <laughs> coach. I'm a good pack and shooter. <laughs> our, our heart rate doesn't get up as high, right? And this is a terrible example, but probably one most of us can understand. But then you put us in front of 10,000 people and our heart rate changes, our mechanics change. You guys know that it, the play college, that's like it, it, it's when you put an enormous amount of people and then you throw TV on it, everything starts to speed up and get changed. So the answer to your question is by the time – these teams at SCTC, SEC teams and Texas like that, where they play in front of 7,000, 10,000 people, where everybody is performing at a high level, it's on TV, as you just mentioned, which ESPN Plus has made college baseball unreal. Because you can flip, as you mentioned, Tuesday through Sunday, there's a t there's a college baseball game on if you want to find it. But all these teams, by the time they get to Omaha, they played and these get, their heart rate is, is settled. Now, it's going to – Omaha is going to – inject some into it because you're on a national stage playing for a national title, but you're used to that environment, you know, from a media perspective, you're used to that environment crowd wise and, and having to perform at a high level. Look, if you're playing in front of 15,000 people at, you know, at Alex Box stadium and all of them screaming and hollering at you at LSU, I mean, you, you you've been tested a little bit. Same as if you walk into Dutch Falk field and play, I still one of the most intimidating things for people to do is walk into Dutch Falk field. And, and play and, and you know seven thousand people in there, but the the aura of being in that stadium means something. No doubt about it. It's the Outsiders brought to you by Poncho. We're talking with Ty Harrington, um, Bo, and Ty. Let's make sure we get this info out because there's a tournament coming up, uh, Ty, that I know you're a part of in June. Uh, the Coaches versus Cancer event. Tell them a little yeah. bit about it. Yeah, Coaches versus Cancer, and Steve Tremere out at UT Golf Course, who's one of the all-time great Longhorns himself, uh, they're going to host us out there. This will be the second year we had it. Coach Terry will be out there because Coaches versus Cancer, which I'm on the executive committee for the, uh, the golf tournament in Austin, but it is kind of – it is not kind of. It's driven by college basketball coaches and high school coaches, and it's obviously for a great cause. It's certainly something personal to me. Uh, I haven't been a cancer patient for a long time, and – and, and you, there's, you know, very few people that in your lifetime and our lifetime that aren't going to be touched by that horrible disease one way or another. Um, and this is another way to, to try to help awareness, raise money, do different things. It's a, it's a, it's a, a disgusting, horrible disease that we somehow, sometime in, in, in the future, we've got to figure out how to get a handle on it. And these are one of those ways to try to do it and help out. It's a great golf tournament and it's a lot of fun. The prizes are cool. The swag's cool, which is always what everybody's really more interested in anything else. And so the dinner's great. And then obviously the golf course is unbelievable. <clears throat> it's June 3rd. Very cool. Almost June 3rd, UT Golf Club. Hey, Coach Harrington, can you text me the information once you have it? Because we're going to start sending yep. it out to all the social media and all that stuff because yep. – I have a sneaking suspicion Chance and I may enter a team in said tournament. Um, and, and Chance is the only one amongst us outsiders who 15,000 seems like a weak night to him because he's <laughs> used to playing in front of 100,000. <laughs> That's right. right? You know, what are we going to do? 
Hey, 15,000 of those LSU baseball fans, that's a little bit different. That's, hey, a, that's a little different. I, w- I will tell you one time we were playing, this was before, this is when Kansas had not won a game in three years in the Big 12. <laughs> and Coach Brown, it was one of the most intimidating things ever because Coach Brown told us it was Halloween night. And he said, guys, I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be a lot of people dressed up like seats when we get to the game. <laughs> we were like, all right. And so you're so used to – it's the reverse effect. You're so used to playing in front of sold-out crowds that when we got there, it felt empty. It felt like a spring game. It was the oddest feeling I've ever had in my life. And I was like, well, this sucks. Like, I mean, you still got to play. But I came to Texas to play in front of a couple million on TV and 100,000 at home. And I love playing in College Station. I'm so glad that freaking game. Right. But, you know, real quick before we – I know we have a commercial, but I want to ask your opinion because you were part of playing a and in those heated weekend series that were so great to watch all those years. How pumped are you that that's now coming back? Well, I used to tell a friend of mine, and, and there's two parts to this. One, I'm gonna, when we get a chance, I'm going to tell you about y'all's guest from a week ago, Greg Swindell, and I'll tell you a story about him and A&M. But secondly – I used to tell people if I was ever governor of the Texas, I was going to give not give them a choice. They had to play. Rather, they were in the SEC, we were in the Big 12, whatever it was. Hey, you guys are taking state money. Let's go. Let's get this game going back. Because that's all everybody wants to talk about, right? And 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 it's a game that you know. And I get it. That I get totally understand why the two teams haven't played. But man, now think you know. It used to be everybody's Thanksgiving. I grew up the same way. It was everybody's Thanksgiving the day after. And then it was just Texas and Texas A&M. I mean, you just blocked it off on the calendar and, and the schedule and your mind and and uh, the different games that were played. And my cousin who was a, who played at A&M and, uh, you know, Shane Leckler. And so Shane and I go back <clears> and forth about, you know, hey, that, you know, the, the rivalry is back now and it's fun because we enjoyed, you know, when he was playing and, and, uh, it needed to come back. I'm so happy that it that it is back. And um, can you imagine the revenue that's going to come off of that game in oh. College Station, Texas, Austin, Texas, and the state of Texas? Yeah. They're going to pay for at least one eightieth of that Jimbo contract buyout. Just to- <laughs> <laughs> how dare you? How Hold on. dare you? Hold on. In the little known <laughs> facts, and and then Ty can tell his Greg Swindell story because we obviously want to hear it. Shane Leckler is your cousin. Yeah, yeah. Shane so, Leckler. yeah. So it's Shane was going to come individual. to Texas, actually, and mm-hmm. um, and then um, we don't pun enough. And, and uh, no, no. Look, <laughs> there's a lot to this story. Actually, Shane was going to come here, and and uh, Shane was a baseball football player. He was a quarterback in high school, and a linebacker, and a punter, obviously. And um, and Coach Makovic, when he came on his visit. Told him he was going to move him to fullback or something like that, and Shane wasn't interested in that, and so he ended up going to AM. and uh, well, There's a lot more to that. There's, it, it and anything, really I'll tell well. you what. I'll tell you what. If you guys allow Aggies on the outsiders, I'll get him on here, and you guys can get him to tell you the whole story. I think and, uh, he, he's he's truly he's truly a treat. Now let me tell you, <laughs> he's a lot of fun. And uh, now you get a couple, you get a couple of Miller lights down him, and a couple. You know, Casamigos in him. That it, it'll. It's yeah. a Brooks Kieschnick night. So I tell you what. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some stories. I'll tell I think you what. The guest train just moved to Shane Leckler. I think Ooh. you're going to have to text me the number, and me and Chad will reach out and try to get that set up. But funny that you say that. Shane liked Austin, at least when I was going to school here, as much as you did, because one of Shane's best friends from East Bernard was my roommate. And Shane used to drive up from College Station. Oh yeah, no during right? practice, and he would come to our house and have a couple of Miller Lights, and and we'd be yeah. like, "Don't you have to be at practice?" He goes, "No, I show up, I kick a couple balls. They say they're good, and I can leave. They don't want me to get hurt." <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. Now I will tell you this: I don't know if you guys, you guys remember when A um, and M played K State in uh, the Big Twelve Championship. Sir Alamo Parker one, caught a slam somewhere, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. AM was down to their last quarterback, and uh, Shane was the backup. Yep, and so he was, and he actually has a handful of NFL official NFL passes, too, by the way, when he was with the Texans. But, yeah. um, and so, yeah, I mean, he went there as he was going to be a, a quarterback and punter 
and get the chance to play baseball. And every year in the springtime, I go, hey, what's up? He goes, man, they won't even let me get near the baseball field. The only place they'll let me in the baseball field is out in the outfield where I can drink beer and watch a game. They won't even let me get back <laughs> in there. And hit me, so. I tried to go pitch in Texas, and uh, <clears throat> they were – Harmon was good with it. And <clears throat> but Coach Brown said, boy, let me tell you something. If you want to play quarterback at this university, you will be at spring practice. I was like, yeah. all right, well, that's sold. That is that yeah. is fair. By the way, I just want to let y'all know if y'all want to see me get proper starstruck, get Shane Leckler on this show. I might not be able to speak. <laughs> hey, oh, the guest train is rolling. Yeah. I'm getting with Ty right after this. I I haven't spoken to my most of my friends from Eagle pa Eagle Lake and East Bernard in a while who are friends with Leckler. We're gonna find if if Ty can't get us connected, we're gonna get connected. Oh, we get, I can get I can shoot you the number. He's my. he um uh, he, he's gonna answer. Yeah, he's living in Katy, and he's living down in Rockport too. And uh, he has his oldest daughter is going to be a uh, a volleyball player at uh, UTSA next year, and then his youngest daughter is a very elite uh, softball volleyball player. She'll be an mm -hmm. SEC oh. player. That is awesome. Chad, you remember when I gave you the John David Crow helmet as a gift? Oh yeah, I've got it right here. If you want to see it, the the, yeah. the autographed John David Crow helmet. Yeah. This is your next gift is I'm going to get with Coach Harrington and we're going to get Shane Leckler, the best football player to ever come out of Texas A&M ever wow. on the outside. <laughs> wow. I like how you say that as a joke. The man should be in the Hall of Fame. He's the no, greatest he should be in the Hall of Fame. He's, He's the best the punter that ever fucking lived. He's the yeah. greatest punter that ever lived. When I die, it's either he's still going to be the greatest punter that ever lived or Michael Dixon might catch him. We're going to have to find out. It's one of those two. It's either an, an Aggie or a Longhorn for me is the best Tucker. punter. That ever lived. Hopefully, getting the Hall of Fame from the University of Texas as the best place kicker oh, in the last 50 years. Yes. Shane oh, Leckler was a better punter than Justin Tucker was a kicker. Yeah. And I'm not saying, like, Shane a, Leckler was a ridiculously good punter. That's well, a bold statement. You might be right there. That's bold either way, but uh, I don't know. I, I, he I was, might agree there. He was such a good, he was so phenomenal at his job that he changed the way that coaches coached games because they knew yeah. that they, he could cough and kick and put it in a corner. And so you could coach differently. It freed you up to do so much. I mean, truly a special team's weapon, and not one that scores points for you, but one that keeps you constantly on the right side of the field. I mean, the dude was phenomenal. All right, it's The Outsiders, brought to you by Poncho. This is where I show I'm a true pro. Ty, you said you were going to tell a Greg Swindell story. So uh, why don't you uh, lay, lay one on us from Mr. Swindell back in the day? I'll try to move through this one as quick as I can. And I had kind of a, a front row seat for this. We were, I, I want to say it was 85. We were really, really good. And it was actually the best team I'd ever played on. We'd won, we, I'm sorry, we'd played in the national championship in 84 and was was really good. Swindell won 19 games that year, whatever ridiculous number it was. And then the next year in 85, we had to go to AM to play. And we had won – Zeke threw a complete game on Friday night, and I think it was the only series that we went Friday, Saturday, Sunday back then. Used to you went Friday and then a double on Saturday. And so we, we won Friday night. We went on Saturday. And Sunday, got the game got away from us um, somehow, and we're getting beat by eight going into, like, the eighth inning. And, you know, it's just one of those things that just – at that time, we – we were, and again, we were really good. Dodd Johnson had one of the most unbelievable weekends. I don't know how many homers he hit that weekend. It was ridiculous, the amount. And and uh, and all of a sudden, we go from an eight run. We start cutting this lead down, and you could just feel it was coming. And we all knew it. We knew what was about to happen. And I think we load the bases in the, in the ninth, and we're only down three. And Rusty Richards hits a single that gets past the right fielder. Next thing you know – we're tied. Everything's – our dugout's going absolutely nuts. And this is where it gets to be Greg Swindell's story. We had a guy on the mound who was really good, and uh, he was maybe his third inning of work, and you could probably see he was tiring a little bit. Well, we scored the tying run. I'm standing at the other end of the dugout, and all of a sudden this guy comes running by me, and it's because the bullpens were all the way down in right field back then. And, um, and it was Zeke. And so he kind of – he takes off on his own. Grabs the catcher, starts warming up. Next thing you know, Chuck Gertley pinch hits, hits a ball in the, in the six hole. We score a run to go up. Now we're up like, I don't know what to score, 13 to 12. Who knows what the score was at this point? We knew at that point we were going to win. 
But what everybody really didn't know, including Coach Gus, and so when the inning was over and they get the third out finally, Coach Gus, he would always walk back behind home plate and never jogged. He just kind of walked, took his time, had his hands in his back pocket. And by the time he makes the loop, I'm standing somewhere near Clint Thomas, who was the pitching coach, and all of a sudden, everybody's coming out of the dugout. Swindell runs by the dugout and just takes off for the mound and says, I got it. Tells Clint Thomas, our pitching coach, goes, I got it. <laughs> three outs five minutes later we're on the bus singing like a bunch of drunk buffoons having a great time and, and uh and just having the time of our life and really and i gotta be honest with you, i left this piece out the, the the third game if we won the third game and swept them we automatically had clinched a tie for the southwest conference title with only when I say only at the time, only Houston left to play at home. So we were going to, we were going to win at least one, if not all of them anyway, but Swindell <laughs> runs by and tells the pitching mm-hmm. coach, passing his hand, I got this. <laughs> it's off for the mound. Three outs later, 30 seconds. He didn't take very long. We're on a bus high five and just like it was drawn up. It's like coach Gus drew it up. That's Man. supreme confidence. He's I like, know who was, coach, I'm going in. I want to know who was on the bump. Did they come out with their glove like they're about to go take it in the ninth? I mean, I, again, he was just kind of like, hey, I got this. I'm, now, I'm good, man. I'm, you know, and he, and I, I, a lot of people don't know really. There were there were probably, I don't know how many times in Zeke's career that he would pitch on Friday and come back in relief and uh, and close games out. And it's just any, any, any time. There was a need for it. He felt like he was ready, which he always thought he was ready, by the way. He was ready to go take them out. You didn't you didn't ask. He was standing there right by Coach Guest going, I'm I'm ready, coach. Just tell me what we gotta do. It's hard to find anymore. That's a so, different kind of green light right there. I was That's a say, different kind of green light. Co- coach, did you ever have honestly in your tenure as a coach, would you have put up with a pitcher? Just inserting himself onto the mound in the ninth. Uh, yeah, if he was pretty good. <laughs> he asked me if I would have let Yeah. If he'd been Greg Swindell, yeah. I'd been waiting for him. I'd have taken my time to let the next guy out. The, the guy who was in the game, I'd have stalled him in the dugout. Nice. So, so, tell me he was ready. My question, Ty, is if I'm standing next to Coach Gus at that moment when Swindell's headed to the mound, if I turn to Coach Gus and say, Coach, why are you going with Swindell? Does he turn to me and just say, I got a hunch? <laughs> like, yeah. the general, like it was his idea? What if, well, if you're Coach Gus, you didn't have to say anything. Just, nothing. <laughs> just shut up and watch. And you just kind of watch. He's kind of pointed at home plate, pointed at the mound, and said, Yeah, that guy right there. Oh, man. 21. Hey, uh, the, the thing I would, since you're on that series, Ty, um, when they get it back in baseball, obviously this year, and, and I love the fact that baseball kept it going too. Shout out to, uh, yeah. Augie Garrido, rest in peace, and Coach Childress for keeping the two on the field every year. But when it goes back to a series, I kind of want the old two-for-one. The younger kids yeah. may not remember the two-for-one, yeah. but I like a Friday in one spot, and let's go to the weekend in the other place. Would you be okay for the old Southwest Conference two-for-one when we get back together? Yeah, absolutely. And you know how they pulled that off was originally it was Baylor, AM, and Texas. So yeah. there was a three-way deal so that all three teams would do all three teams did it uh throughout the year. Hell yeah. I think it would be awesome. And I think you know the fans I'll, I'll tell you what you remember last year when they were trying to decide I remember if, if it was Stanford got or whoever got beat that they didn't or whatever it was who would might host the super regional between Texas and Texas AM I think it was was regional or super regional. And, and anyway, I was kind of like, well, the NCAA is smart, man. But one of them at, you know, at Texas, one of them at College Station, and then the third game would be in Austin. You don't think that wouldn't have gone nuts and the ESPN wouldn't have gone nuts for, for two different crowds mm-hmm. and, and that kind of rivalry or something like that? And uh, so, yeah, I, th- I hope they do. I don't know if they will, um, but I it, it was fun. Everybody gets a little bit of a taste of it. Yeah, that'd be cool. I know we're, we're keeping you very long, Coach, but you're entertaining the hell out of us, and, and I love it. But we haven't even asked you about quite possibly the best player you've ever been on a field with from a coach and player perspective, Paul Goldschmidt, who played at Texas State before becoming the MVP, future Hall of Famer for the Cardinals. What did you know 
as his coach, watching him come up as a young man, that he was that good, or did he become that good? Uh, a little bit of both. So obviously, he came from one of the you know best high school baseball programs in the state. Don't give chances um, Woodlands any oh, credit. I knew, I knew he, I knew he'd go get it. That's so why I was kind hey, of leading him into it a little. Where bit. I went and, to high school, Round Rock High has produced yeah, way I mean, more. I, you know, not as I mean, it's, talented as Paul, but way more. Yeah. Well. So Goldie, there was two teams that recruited him. That was it. Um, us and Air Force. And, um, you know, he was a kind of a bigger lumbering guy. They were trying to play him at third and short. And, and uh, you know, I, I, his summer league, the truth is, I would love to tell you it was one of the greatest recruiting jobs on my part. His summer league coach had been a longtime friend of mine, Mike, Mike Rutledge. And, uh, and Mike said, hey, this guy's going to be an unbelievable player. So we started paying closer attention to him. He had a lot of power. You know, he had a home run that year in the state championship game uh, to win the state championship for him. And so you got to taste a little bit about how good he was going to be. And <clears throat> the story about Goldie for me was he was trying to play third. And I was trying to – his arm action wasn't great when he first got there. And I was trying to show him something about his arm action – I came out the next day and he was out there by himself doing exactly what I showed him the day before. So you got a small glimpse of who he was, what he was starting to become. But I, I would tell this till I'm blue in the face. I've never, I want to say never is a hard word, but I don't know that I've been around a, a more diligent, smarter, efficient worker than Paul Goldschmidt. And I don't know, I could, I could share the platform about what I'm about to say. I've had a bunch of guys who love the process, but Goldie just absolutely loves the process of practice and working out to get the play. That is his thing. So two summers ago, a short story, my daughter's playing a softball game in Seguin, Texas. It's 163 degrees and I'm standing out in the outfield sweating my you-know-what's off, and I, I, I called Goldie the day before to ask him th this very question, and he calls me back. He goes, Coach, what are you doing? I said, Goldie, I'm sweating. That's all I'm doing right now, <laughs> but I got a question for you, and I wanted to know why, after being in the big leagues as long as he had been, which was a meteoric rise, by the way, from college straight to the big leagues, and I want to know why that year he was on the trail of winning the MVP still had two months left in the season when he tells his story. And he said, coach, it dated back a year and a half ago. And I was like, what? He goes a year and a half ago. I was, my swing was good. I'm not going to bore you guys with all the details. My swing was good, but my load was gone. There was something. I had my body tested. I had a deficiency in my right hip or something strength wise. And so I changed strength coaches. I trained every my, all my training I went to this guy who trains, he's actually an LSU guy, who trains Tiger Woods and Dustin Johnson and those guys down in Houston now. I mean, I'm sorry, down in Florida. He goes, I went and I changed my swing. I went to a golf guy to, to help my – so he went through an hour and a half discussion about how he's changed his training, how he, you know, he videos everything he does. He loves to hit. He loves to practice. He loves to do all these things. But his point was, I, he goes, Coach, I was working harder than I ever worked, but I wasn't – working on the right thing. I was just in there banging balls. And then all of a sudden I found out I had an issue of, and I wasn't able to hold my load as long as I needed to hold my load before I got ready to let the barrel release and do all this stuff. It, incredibly technical deal, but that's who he was. And he goes, it took me to this point to get where I am today to make that adjustment and to make that change. And here I am and I'm having the best year I've ever had. And I said, Goldie, you're, 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 you're trending to win the MVP. He goes, Coach, I, I don't know. I'm just I'm having a great I'm having a great year and, I'm, and things. This is a typical goalie response too. He goes, Coach, things are falling my way. The balls are falling. <laughs> you know, the hits are falling in. Right? You've watched him hit a home run, right? You don't see any anything other than set the bat down, run around those, put his head down, run around those bases, tap the guy in front of him, head to the dugout, and that's well, just that's who he is. I, I think it's fun. I think it's fascinating to hear you say that, Coach, because one of my my best friend growing up, and we're still friends, Vincent Sinisi, his dad, yeah. Vinny Sinisi, was our he was always our coach growing up. Matter of fact, it was really yeah. cool this year. Vincent and I still coach a Marucci team together, and his dad coached with us this year. So all three of us, it was pretty awesome. But he told us a story of being in the batting cages at the Woodlands, and he said Goldie was sitting up and would get to the point of attack. And would stop and then redo. He said, I sat and watched him for 30 minutes. 
He didn't take one swing. He was just sitting there trying to figure out, I mean, perfect it, like to a P, yeah. trying to understand how his swing worked together and how all the pieces were connected and when to fire at the right time. He said it's absolutely fascinating. He had never seen anybody that was that meticulous. He's that meticulous. He's that detailed. And then he's also that committed to carrying it out. Like there's a lot of mad scientists and a lot of us have, including myself, and I'm sure you guys maybe fall in this category, maybe not. We all have tremendous ideas and we have this creativeness to us and different things in our life, whether it's our profession or personal life, whatever it may be. And he has that creativeness too, and he loves it, but he reacts to it and then commits to it. A lot of us react to it, think about it, react to it, but then don't commit to it completely and follow it all the way through. And that detail that you were just talking about, where you know the, the Sinisi you're talking about, is that's who he is. That's that's the, the person he is, and that's why he is going to be a Hall of Famer. I mean, he's not just going to be a great player in the Cardinals and the Diamondbacks organization. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. No doubt. And Anybody by the else? way, and by the way, your boy Sinisi wasn't a bad left-handed hitter himself, by the way. <laughs> I had to try to get that cat out a couple of times too. And you talking about that, you talking about that tube staying in the hitting zone for a long time and being able to zero in on some balls. He was really good. Well, Don't let it, Vince ever hear that. No. <laughs> <laughs> like baseball players are known for their egos. Vince doesn't need anybody to tell him how good he is. You know what's <laughs> you know what's kind of funny? So Vincent gave these to my my son. And these are, you can see there's the Italian flag. He played in the World Baseball Classic, and these were some of his batting gloves. He was on the Italian team, and he'll tell a great story. Sometime we'll have him tell it about how he he was hitting behind and protecting Mike Piazza. Piazza was hitting the three-hole. He hit the four-hole in that, in that World Baseball. He said, man, I'm telling you. He said, I, you know, it was because of me that he got all those great pitches. <laughs> oh, yeah. He got, he, oh, he got at least four more fastballs a game because you know, I was sitting behind him, right? That's right. The dude from the Netherlands was scared of Vince Sinisi, so he took <laughs> cheese to Mike Piazza. <laughs> Who, by the way, is built like a brick shit house. The dude is massive. Yeah. Uh, wait, the the Dutch pitcher is? No. no. Wow. Mike Piazza. <laughs> no, that's pitcher number 13 yeah. from, from McNeil that Jason homered off of at JV Ball. Vincent was trying to pump Fair balls enough. out, and he said he was hitting the ball hard, but he couldn't get it. He couldn't get the backspin to get it out. He said Piazza gets up there and he's just cranking around. He goes, what the hell? He's like, we had this 25-mile-an-hour wind coming in our face, and Piazza just pumping them out. And he goes, well, if you hit the fucking ball hard enough, it'll go out of any park. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a slugger. You just If you just hit it hard enough, it'll go out. And that's Everybody why Piazza's out. in the Hall of Fame and our boy Vince is, you know, that's, not. <laughs> that's probably true. Anybody else got anything for Ty Harrington yeah. before we let him go? Coach, you've been fantastic. I was Thanks, saying you were coach. amazing. Hey, I hope we- I, I appreciate it. I got to be honest with you. I was. I, usually, when I get in these podcasts, I'm a little uptight at the beginning. But again, when Jason broke out the alcohol part of this thing, it just kind of loosened up. I didn't have a sip of it, but it just kind of <laughs> you know, made things right at that point in time. And so we don't fact, pack I, around. I, I, hey, and keep I, in mind, look, I wasn't even not drinking drink alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't even going to drink tonight. And after watching Jason, I felt like I should run to the fridge real quick and get my Michelob Ultra just to fit in. So I appreciate your bad influence on my life. That is it. That is hey, it. Coach, mark the first Monday on November on your calendar. You okay. now have a cordial invite to our Super Cooper Golf. Uh -oh. He froze, but I'll tell you, it's a Super Cooper Golf Tournament. It's phenomenal. Brooks Kieschnick will be out there. Bunch of baseball. It's a blast. You need to be It's there. all awesome. baseball, guys. Justin love to be Simmons there. is involved uh, in it. Uh, yeah. You're playing. You have no I'd choice. I'd love to be a part of it. I appreciate the invite. And if it's got golf, alcohol, and, and a lot of baseball people around it, then I'm going to have a great time. I'll be a it, part of it. It's a UT baseball reunion tour, if you will, because it's almost all UT baseball guys. We didn't yeah, get we to talk it. about the season hardly coming up this year. Yeah. Well, you we'll don't have what? to have we'll, you back. I said, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get you back on at some point. We'll get it. We'll, we'll try to be proper and do like a preview and stuff. Bring it back, and I'd love to come back home. We'll talk about UT baseball. I'm going to tell you what, they're getting it going. Um, to what, to, they had the alumni game this weekend, and then uh, they get cranked up on the 16th. And uh, I'll tell you what, Coach Pierce is excited about what they've got going on. So it's going to be yeah. a, long, a lot of fun. Coach Trout is, too. I was at the, I saw them yesterday at a preseason show with them, and um, they, got, they got a chance to be special, too. So they're excited. So 
College baseball is here. I know you guys are big time football people, and so am I. But I'm gonna tell you what, college baseball. This is the oh. best it's ever been, and it just keeps getting freaking better every year, and it's going to continue on. It's it out. absolutely the best. Ty, we appreciate the time. Take care of yourself, and uh, hopefully we can grab you at some point uh, as the season's getting started, man. Safe travels. Yeah, thank you, guys. Enjoyed it, by the way. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yes, it. Sir. Thanks, Coach. Ty Harrington, one of the best. And uh, in case you are a college baseball fan, we were talking to him before. He's going to be on ESPN Plus on the TV side at times doing games. He's going to be on with Craig Way, calling some Longhorn games on the radio. Um, I love – he's one of my favorite baseball voices, guys. I love listening to him break the game down. Just such a wonderful, comfortable voice and the way he tells everything. He makes me feel like I know more baseball every time I listen to him. So I can't wait to hear those games. He has a nice mix of the technical and the fun. Like mm-hmm. he was willing to fuck it up with Jason while also <laughs> getting into the load of Paul Goldschmidt. Yeah. So I, I, I was going to point out that uh, Coach said uh, something along the lines of uh, he couldn't hold his load, and I just straight faced it. And just <laughs> it. Yeah, right. you know what? Yeah, I'm that glad you respect. said that. that I'm glad respect, you said guys. that, Jason, because all three of you deserve a volleyball clap. He said hold his load, and the three of you looked like you were at an insurance seminar. Well done, all three of you. Oh, trust that- me. I was oh, writing down all the things I was going to say, and I was like, nope, not the oh. time, not the place. I mean, I all figured you- Jason couldn't hold back. I-, I did a quick check. I did a quick check of all three of you, and all three of you were – <laughs> I mean, y'all were locked in. Well done, boys. Well done. That's Been why we he had a vibe where it's like I almost, almost felt like he was doing it on purpose to see who was going to say something. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good, fantastic. All and right, the guest, uh, and the guest snake rolls on. All right, oh, Sam Leckler is happening now. It is. Oh. Hey, I didn't even – people are going to think I planned that one. I didn't plan it. I've heard Ty Harrington say that before, Bo. I knew that he was related to Shane. I'd forgotten it. And when he said it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I've heard him say that before. Because one of the first times he and I were together, he mentioned it when he found out I was an Aggie. And, yeah, oh, my God. I might I might not be able to speak. Y'all might have to talk to Shane Leckler, and I'll just sit here like this. I'm telling you, time. we're going to get him on just so I can ask him the question of when he came to my house in college, we had this gigantic tree in the front yard. And he used to come and drink, I won't say on the regular, but at least once a week he would drive up from College Station and have six or ten beers with his old teammate from East Bernard, mm-hmm. who was my roommate at the time. And like, like we'd always ask, like, y'all are supposed to be practicing. He goes, oh, coach said I don't need to practice. Like, <laughs> he goes, I show up to practice just so everybody sees me. I kick a couple balls. As long as he's okay with how I kicked him, he says, get the fuck out of here because he doesn't want me to hurt my hamstrings. <laughs> and so he would he would drive to Austin and get drunk and then go to 6th Street. But we had this gigantic tree, and there was a, a wager about the tree that he couldn't kick it over the tree. This is a monster of a tree, but – it was obvious he was going to kick it over the tree, but it was more just to get him to do it <laughs> because it was like, he's not really going to do this in the middle of the yard at four in the afternoon with a bunch of Miller lights. I'll be damned. That motherfucker kicked it over the tree, right footed and left footed. He's not even left footed, mm. but he pulled out, he, like he'd done it enough, just goofing. He kicked it over the tree both ways. Can I wow. tell you what would have made that story even better? Is if he missed the game on Saturday from a pull down <laughs> from kicking a ball over a tree at Mo's house. <laughs> No, yeah. he probably said he probably still had a 45 yard average in the game that weekend, knowing him. No. Uh, we we got to get him because I don't think Chad could hold his load. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. I'll try to contain myself. Hey, just, hey, at least the at least there's a screen from the neck up and not from the waist down. <laughs> so we won't know how that works out. <laughs> Oh man, that will be fantastic! I'm so glad oh, we're getting that. Leckler next week. It, I don't know whether it's Wednesday, Thursday. We may have a special Tuesday edition if we have to. We're gonna man. have Shane Leckler just for Chad. That is fantastic. All right, so we will hope that happens. Uh, before we get out of here, uh, Mr. Mock, why don't we tell him a little bit about Prodigy Mortgage, sir? Absolutely, our guy Thad Lindsay and his crew over there do a phenomenal job. You know, we just had a great coach on and you know you can have the best team but you got to have a coach that can get you through the finish line and our guys over at prodigy mortgage his whole team over there look they will guide you through the process they'll make sure that the house appraises they'll matter of fact they'll even pay for it if you tell them you're from the outsiders so 
they'll get this done. They will get the house, get the, get the hassle out of it. Let them handle it. Scan that QR code right there. Give Thad and his team a call. I know it's springtime's coming up. That's when the time people start looking for new houses. Why? Because they want to get into the new house in the summer so that their kids don't have to change school and everything else. Hey, give Thad and his crew a call, 281-772-6786, or just scan that QR code. But tell Thad you heard about him on The Outsiders. Get that $500 in your pocket because he will pay for that appraisal. There you have it, The Outsiders. So, yes? I was going to say, the one problem with getting Leckler – is the guest train is going to take a, a kind of detour into, I don't know, places we want to go because which Aggie is he going to throw us next? This is going to become he, the Aggie he interview hour. Long, you know? He spent a long time in the NFL, and I bet he hung out with a lot. He probably drank a lot. If he drank beer with Bo Edge, he probably drank beer with a lot of cool people that he can hook us up with. So, so what happens when his answer is Casey stuttered as to who he's going to give us on the guest? Well, I was going to say, Bo, why don't you do this? Why don't you challenge him and you you let him know that we are glad to talk to him, but then at the end of it, just say you can't pick an Aggie, anybody but an Aggie. Nope. Okay, well, that, I just want to make sure you're not agifying the show. That's all. <laughs> Hey, boy, look, he was going on and on about Shane Leckler, and I redirected back to the Greg Swindell story. Do not I we're question go. my I know we're, we're shooting, shooting for Andre Biden. Johnson. We're going from Shane Ooh. Leckler to Andre Johnson, and then the sky's the limit. That would be a good transition, actually. If he could hook us up with Andre Johnson, that's a whole nother that's a whole nother deal. No, he, he he's gonna kick it to Chance Mock, Texans quarterback for one whole <laughs> one whole training camp. Hey, hey, I've always wanted to talk to Chance Mock, so don't don't make fun of that. Oh, he's I a think great that'd be dude. a great interview. Yeah, especially when he's not getting banned from the YouTube machine. <laughs> <laughs> one time and one time only. I Just learned one. my lesson. I served my kids. Swindell didn't coax Ty into trying to get your <laughs> He was banned. He was banned one time. One time. <laughs> Bo is froze. Go back like two or three shows if you want to know why Chance was banned. Mm. Don't he do showed, that. He showed, he showed something that nope. He, nope. He, he never showed a defense that, but he showed it to us. It's crazy. It's Look, crazy. I went to the I went to the Catholic Church and I, I said my six Hail Marys and I am for I am good. I am washed mm. of this poor decisions of which I made, and I will not make them again. <laughs> There you go. Washed in the ink of the tattoo, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, before before we get out of here, Bo, we do need to mention um, another event going on here. And I know this one is close to your heart and a lot of folks in the Round Rock area. It is. And I just, a friend of me and a group of friends just signed a team up in this event. It's going to be April 25th at Forest Creek. It's going to be the first annual Jeff Onavera's Field of Dreams charity golf tournament. Scan the QR code. Send me an email. Do whatever you want. We want this to be the biggest event in Round Rock to honor the memory of Jeff Onavera's, who, like I said, I grew up with Jeff, went to high school with Jeff. He's one of the reasons that I quit playing baseball because he was so much better at it than me. <laughs> like Jason, <laughs> Jason said, fuck it. I'm just going to keep going. And he hit his homer off McNeil number 13. I said, well, it's not going to happen as a slow-ass catcher because Jeff Monteveris, Joey Hart, Andy Peoples. So my ass navigated to golf. But in all seriousness, Jeff Monteveris was a great man who did a lot for the community. He won a national title at the University of Texas. And his family has put this tournament together, amongst other things, to build a foundation to help coach youth baseball. So scan the QR code and, and, and really give it a look. There you go. The Field of Dreams event there. And there is that QR code. We appreciate you doing that and supporting that event. And remember, we are the Outsiders brought to you by Poncho. There's Colt in a Poncho shirt. PonchoOutdoors.com. Bo's got a Poncho shirt on. We've all experienced the Poncho shirt deal. And uh, in fact, I think our man, does Blake the super producer have a Poncho t-shirt on tonight? Did I see that correctly? Yep, he does. Because uh, they're comfortable as hell. They're comfortable as hell. They're built well. It's good. They're right there. Those are the shirts. They're in my house. My girls wear those t-shirts all the time. Well, with your new job, fun. you can buy a lot more of those poncho shirts. <laughs> we couldn't pay you very much, Blake, but now you can have a whole wardrobe of ponchos. And some more uh, Texas State last stand hats as well. There you go. There it is. <laughs> He's covered. Wonderful guest. 
He is all covered. Right. Shout out to Colt and Poncho. Thank you for the show. You need to tune in tomorrow night because it is our Sayunara to Blake episode. It is his final episode as super producer, mm. although he may come back in various capacities because I don't give a damn what your day job is. You can show up at 9 o'clock at night once in a while for your boys. Oh, I'll be here. I'll just be in the chat causing a ruckus, though. No, no, no. You're coming back on with a little screen. We'll, we'll make you a, a link because once an outsider, always an outsider. Yeah, so that's right. We have an arguments with Razor over in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cuz at some point Me and Razor going to be ganging up on Jason in the chat. I was going to say and, don't and don't step to Razor. He's a bad Pittman man. Golf tournament is in June. Look it up on Facebook. Go check out Stevie Lee's Facebook page. Go check out Roy Williams, go check out BJ, go check out their pages they promote the the golf tournament. Yeah, and at some point on the Outsiders, that guest snake, it's probably going to go if we get Chris Abbott on, then he will get us Razor. And then Razor is going to get us Blake. That's probably the way that's going to go at some point along the line. Now we'll, we'll go. We'll go from Razor to Chris Abbott, Chris Abbott to Troy Tulowitzki, and Troy Tulowitzki to Blake. Oh, that'd be even better. Yeah, hey guys, I'm going Chris to call Chad Hastings. Here he is, actually, right now. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Speaking of Chris Abbott, tomorrow is one of those monumental moments in a father's life. Mm-hmm. He helped me acquire. We're going to get my daughter's first vehicle. She turned oh. 16 in oh. April. So we needed to get her a vehicle. So she she just she, we're going to get her learner's permit on Tuesday. I'm mm-hmm. taking my daughter to go get her first vehicle purchased at Covert Ford through Mr. Abbott. But that's one of those life like life-changing moments. Like I'm buying my daughter a vehicle. Like I can barely stay sober enough to do this Man. show. And now I'm buying vehicles for people. But before she turns 16, Bo, will you adopt me? Can I get in the? Can I get in? You gotta practice in the truck in the vehicle you're gonna drive. Yeah. yeah. So the only two vehicles in in my household that she could practice on are my truck, which is too big for her, and my wife's Jeep, which is way too big for her. My wife's Jeep has a six inch lift and 36 inch VF Goodrich all terrains. Wow. It's got a little more wiggle oh, than she's ready for. Oh, there's a lot of people watching this show that just think, have just started thinking a lot more of Bo's wife. Not that they oh, my wife's that awesome. Bo's wife, but oh my God, that's fantastic. <laughs> Sounds like the kind of woman you want to go driving with right there. Let's go. We locked him up. <laughs> yeah, <then laughs> my wife is cool as shit. That's all I'm going to say. My wife is awesome. <laughs> There we'll never know what he said while he was frozen. If she could only fix the Wi-Fi. Hey, everybody's well, you got know what? Drink. Fuck it. My wife's still cool as shit. <laughs> Nobody was challenging the coolness of your wife. We're all on board. No, we, we, no, we, we, we weren't challenging it. It's now increased, though, when you describe yeah. that vehicle. That's impressive. Oh, her, all right. her Jeep's way cooler than my truck. I guarantee to you that. Well, congrats to you, uh, the father going to get the vehicle. That is that is good stuff. As a father whose daughter is driving right now, he, he get get you some extra brown water for uh, for the thoughts that will. I don't run think there's head, enough sir. in the world. No, I don't think there is. There's not. But it is a great it is a great experience to see him uh, see him heading out into the world a little bit. All yeah, right. The great experience is in two months when I'm like, hey, uh, it's one in the morning. I need you to come pick me up. In the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. They, they, yeah, becoming the DD can also be uh, can also be very, very helpful. All right. So uh, I believe when Blake made the reference to me, he was trying to get us to stop, gentlemen. So <laughs> let's go ahead and Good do luck that. On that Ace. It is The Outsiders brought to you by Poncho. And we will be back tomorrow night. It will be. Blake's last official show with the Outsiders, so we'll say goodbye to Blake. We may talk about some of the stuff we were going to talk about tonight, uh, including some Longhorns looking good at the Senior Bowl. We'll give them a little love tomorrow. Uh, Thank you for supporting. Like, subscribe, get your notifications to Orange Bloods Live. Y'all have a great night until 9 o'clock tomorrow night for a Thursday edition. We are the Outsiders. We had Ty Harrington on. And that pretty much makes us legitimately worth a shit.